Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the communion meditation part of this morning's service. Due to the coronavirus and the social distancing, our physical location and restrictions this morning may be different than on normal Sunday worship service. But our faith, our dedication, our commitment to service to the Lord should not waver. These things should not change. Because as Christians, we have a responsibility to continue to be steadfast, faithful, and to follow the teachings of Christ. To be a bright, shining example to the world of what God would have us to be, especially during difficult times such as these. Paul understood that. Paul endured much suffering and much tribulation through his ministry. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul wrote, be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. This is for God's will for you in Jesus Christ. A Christian's joy is not dependent upon earthly circumstances. It comes from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and from what he has done for us. And he, Christ, is constant. He does not change. He's always been there for us and always will be. Because of all the changes presently going on in our lives due to the virus, kids being home, shortages at the grocery stores and all the other restrictions, events canceled, it's easy to get distracted. The world around us seems uncertain of tomorrow and it's searching for answers. That's why we need to focus and reestablish what is really important to us at times. The Lord's Supper is a memorial service that does that. It reminds us of what Jesus did for us. It helps us to stay steadfast and focused on what is truly important in our lives. Luke chapter 22, verse 17 through 20, gives us a record of the institution of this Lord's Supper. We're all familiar of how Jesus spent the Passover meal the last night of his life here on earth with his disciples and took these emblems, the cup and the bread, and gave them new meaning. So nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus instituted this memorial service, the recognition or the service of his death, so that we would not forget his sacrifice. The pain, the suffering, the humiliation that he endured for us. Jesus was not crucified for any sin of, or transgression of his own. He was nailed to the cross for my sins and for yours. He serves as our once and for all Passover lamb. Because of Jesus, we now have a path to eternal salvation with our Heavenly Father. That is what's important this morning and every morning. And that is why we observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday. This we do in remembrance of him. Thank you. And God bless.
Good morning. It's good to see everybody again, or I, I guess you're seeing me. I can't see you, but <laughs> here we are once again, meeting together on the Lord's Day uh, in a virtual way, but yet we are still meeting. We're the church, and we no one ever forget that. So uh, we're glad to be able to do this and be with you, and I hope you're doing okay. I, I hope your family's doing well, and uh, I hope that everything's going well with you right now. Uh, maybe w weather's going to get to where you can go out and uh, be out in the yard or maybe even run down, go fishing. I think you're allowed to do that. And uh, I heard the other day about an 80-year-old man that went out fishing, and he was sitting there on the bank fishing away, and he heard a voice. And the voice said, uh, hey, hey, you. And he looked around. There wasn't anybody else around. And so he thought, well, I'm hearing things. And so he went on fishing and he heard the voice again. Hey, hey you. And he looked down there was this frog sitting next to him. And he realized, and he said, was you? He said to the frog, he said, Are, was you the one that was speaking? And the frog said, yes, I, it was me. And he said, I used to be a beautiful princess and, and a old witch turned me into a frog. And if you'll just give me a kiss, I'll turn back into a, a beautiful princess and then I'll be forever at your debt and uh, so the old man thought about it a while and picked up the frog put him in his pocket put, put it in his pocket and uh, started walking down head for home and heard this voice from his pocket say hey hey what's going on don't you know that if you kiss me I'd be turned into a beautiful woman and I'd be forever at your debt and he said well he said that's true but at 80 years old I don't need a beautiful woman but with a talking frog, I can make a fortune. So, <laughs> why well, even tell you such a, I, heard, I read that the other day and thought it was kind of a silly but yet cute little story. And sadly, some people, though, kind of put the events that we just celebrated to the resurrection in the same category as a fairy tale or fantasy, uh, that the resurrection is no more possible than a talking frog uh, is. But the fact is, last Sunday, we shared with you a message and a service and, and to celebrate something that's true, celebrate something that's real, and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, you will either believe it or you won't. You'll either be something that, that you, you trust as being true or not. But the fact of the matter is, is, is uh, believing can be backed by evidence. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is vital to our faith. It's vital to our belief. It's vital for us to believe in Jesus as the risen Lord, for our faith to be strong and and even be there. For you know, uh, without the resurrection, there there is no faith. There is no hope. Uh, and so, and that's what Paul shared with us in the Word. Whenever he said, he wrote in in the first Corinthian letter down to fifteenth and third and fourth verse, he said. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. But we don't have to believe in the resurrection as a, a legend or a fantasy. Paul tells us our faith in the resurrection is based upon eyewitness testimony. And as anyone who has ever been in court or watched court on TV, you know that one of the strongest evidences you can have is eyewitness testimony. And not only eyewitness, but multiple eyewitness testimony. Uh, and it's a powerful proof of the truth of, of, of something. If one person gives a testimony, and that's all, that does leave room for doubt. But listen, as we read on that 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, uh, of what Paul says. He says he appeared to Peter after his resurrection. He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. 500 at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. So he's saying some are still living. Go talk to them. They're witnesses. They saw the risen Lord. And then he says he appeared to James and then all the apostles and last of all he appeared to me also. I want to take a closer look at some of these testimonies of, of these eyewitnesses this morning. And 
And now before we do, though, we need to first establish one very important point, and that is Jesus truly died on the cross. Uh, that was the testimony of the soldiers who were professional at execution, and they witnessed the crucifixion. He was officially reported as being dead, and therefore his body would never have been released for burial if he hadn't been reported officially as dead. John told us in John 19.34 that to make sure Jesus was dead, one of the soldiers stabbed him in the side, which pierced his heart. And John tells us that water and blood came out. It was separated, water and blood. And medical evidence shows that that proof of death. Unbelievers have come up with some <laughs> creative stories, if you will, to offer what happened to Jesus. For example, it started off immediately at, after the resurrection that his disciples stole his body. Uh, there's no evidence of that. There's no witnesses of that. But that was what was being reported and said, that, that they stole his body. Uh, some try to say, well, the women went to the wrong tomb. They went to an empty tomb instead of where Jesus was, and that's why they thought it was empty. Again, no evidence of that. Uh, then <laughs> there was one of mass hallucination. Hundreds of people hallucinated. Over 500 people hallucinated seeing him. Uh, ridiculous. No evidence of that. And then, of course, there's the famous what they call the swoon theory, or he just was faint. He wasn't dead. Uh, he didn't. He didn't die, and he was alive in the tomb. And and somehow, he won got the stone away. He wandered out out at the tomb after he had been severely beaten, after he had been nailed to a cross, after he had been pierced in the side to prove his death that somehow he survived all that. Again, ridiculous. No evidence. In Acts 1-3, we read that after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. It says here that Jesus gave many convincing proof that he was alive, his resurrection. And we'll look at just a few of those post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to find some of those convincing proofs. Last Sunday, I did share with you uh, those who witnessed him on the day of resurrection. Uh, at least six women were listed as having seen Jesus alive on that day. And then, then there were the two disciples on the road to Emmaus uh, that uh, witnessed the risen Lord and uh we know that Jesus appeared to a gathering of his disciples that were in behind locked doors, and he appeared to them that evening, uh, and he told them, look at the evidence. He said, examine my body. Look at the nail prints in my hand. Look at the, look at the piercing in my side as evidence that it is me and that I have risen. And then a week later, he appeared and offered Thomas the same invitation to examine his body. Look at his hands. Look at his side. And this removed all doubt from Thomas's mind that this truly was the risen Lord. He was not a, a ghost. He was not a disembodied spirit. He was raised bodily with the mark still upon his body. His wounds were recognizable. And notice what Thomas said over in John 20, 28. He said, You are my Lord and my God, eyewitness testimony. One of the most moving appearances of Jesus after his resurrection is actually found over in the 21st chapter of John. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn with me because we're going to look at that chapter here briefly. The 21st chapter of John as we look at the amazing event that took place after the resurrection of Jesus. And we read this, starting with the first verse of John 21. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. After that, he appeared to them by the Sea of Tiberias. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter told them. And they said, okay, we'll go with you. 
So they went out and they got into a boat, but the night, that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples first did not recognize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which we know is John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had, had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, to towing the net full of fish, for they were not far offshore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus was fixing them breakfast. And he had already built the fire. He had already. And it's interesting here because it says that there were burning coals. Now, in the original language that this was written, there was only two places that the word coals that is used here was used in, in, in the scriptures. The first one was when Peter was standing outside the, the uh, trial of Jesus, and they were standing around a fire of burning coals. Same word and he denied his Savior three times. Now, the only other time that, that word is used, we see Jesus had built the fire of these burning coals to, to fix them breakfast. It's kind of interesting that those were the two times that those coals were mentioned. And Jesus said to them, bring some of your fish over here and you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net to shore and it was full of large fish. In fact, it gives the number here, 153 fish, just by throwing the net out the other side. Uh, and there were so many that the net was, it says, was being torn. So Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew who he was. He was the Lord. And Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised. From the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Now that's an interesting question because we don't know if he meant, do you love the, me more than these other disciples? Or do you love me more than, than others in the world? Uh, but he uses the word there as agape, as for love. He says, Simon, son of John, do you truly agape me? And that is a personal close love, of, of like, a, like brothers in the Lord. And he answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Peter used the word philo here instead of agape, which means I'm your friend. Uh, and it's, and, and it's not as deep as agape. And Jesus then said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Do you agape me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I follow you, or I'm a friend of yours. And he said, okay, then take care of my sheep. He said lambs first. Now he says sheep. We're all in the, the flock of God, but some are lambs, some are sheep, and they needed to be treated differently. They need to be handled differently. But he's calling Simon Peter, not only the lambs, but even the sheep need your guidance. And then a third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Agape. And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I, agape, love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. He finally said, agape. I do love you that, that deeply, that much. Simon had denied Jesus three times. Three times Jesus had asked him if he loved him. And finally, this was the moment that he knew that he had been forgiven for his denial. 
I tell you the truth, he goes on to say in 18th verse, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted them. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said, follow me. But Peter, turning and saw the disciples whom Jesus loved, was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus in the, in the Last Supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if you want him to remain alive, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. Don't worry about John. Don't worry about anybody else. You are the one I'm talking to. You follow me. Very moving discourse that Jesus is having with Simon Peter. It's an it's a aspect of Peter that would change his life from here on out. He'd be a new man, a new person. Uh, and, you know, we might think what they thought back then, so the scriptures goes ahead and ask that because Jesus said this, then there was a rumor spread. They spread rumors back then, too, among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. I'm reading scripture. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? He wasn't saying he wasn't going to die. He was just saying, that's not your business. If I want him to do it, fine. If I don't, fine. But that has nothing to do with you. That's what he was saying to Peter about John. This is the disciple who testified to these things and who wrote them down. This is John. He said, I'm the disciple who testified. Testify again is a strong the testimony of eyewitnesses. And I testify to these things who wrote them down, and we know this testimony is true. This happened. Jesus happened. Jesus is alive. And he fixed breakfast for us on, on the seashore. And he says, I give testimony. And Jesus did many other things as well. He said in that 25th verse, if every one of them was written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Testimony, testimony, proof, evidence, it's amazing, tremendous. Remember what the two disciples at, at Emmaus said uh, when Jesus left them? He said, they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? That was in Luke 24, 32. You see, many have believed since that day the testimonies that, that were given because just as stated by those two disciples in Emmaus, they found proof in the scriptures. We can experience the risen Lord in the same way today. We find proof in the scriptures. We know he lives because of the scriptures. Even the Old Testament scriptures as Peter quoted in Acts 2, in his message in Acts 2 when he quoted the prophet Joel about what was happening with Jesus in his resurrection. This book, this book of the Bible, and everything in this book here is proof. This is our proof. And we see that over 2,000 years it stood the test that has been against it, every aspect, and it's still true. It's still proven, and, and there's no cracks in it. The evidence is solid. The evidence is clear. Jesus has provided many convincing proofs if we will only open our minds and our hearts to him and go to the, the text, the Word of God, examine the evidence, seeing the influence of Jesus in the world today, all around us, and we will be convinced and believe. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we do thank you so much for the evidence. It's overwhelming. We know Jesus is alive. We know Jesus is alive because of the text and the proof and the eyewitnesses, but we also know he's alive because how he is in our lives and how he works in our hearts and our minds and how he has saved us. Many are in this world that do not believe that, and that's sad, but let us share the message. Let us present the proof and the evidence so many more can come to him before the time is, is over. Be with us through again through this difficult time where 
Uh, we know people are hurting. We know people are dying. We know people are suffering. We know there's hardships. But we know, Father, if we just put our hope and trust in you in all things, that you said in all things it works for the good of those who love him. So, Father, we pray for your strength, your uplifting, your healing, and we pray for health amongst all of us and help us to continue to be your family and your church even in these difficult times. Be with those who have special needs in our congregation and bless them and heal them. And now be with us as we continue to strive to do your will even under these circumstances. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.